sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord with my mouth. Will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness with my mouth? Will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. good ways to help memorize Bible verses is if you've got a little tune to them that will help you remember them. And that's a great one, to sing of the mercies of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for your mercies, your mercy in saving us and your mercy in allowing us to live day and day and just know that every single day that rolls around, there are new mercies that come before us every day and we thank you for them. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church tonight. Bless each and every one. May your word speak to their hearts. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. All right. In that same book, if you find 128, 128, and we'll sing this good, true song, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. 128. We'll sing all three stanzas, make a few announcements, move on with our service tonight. One, two, eight. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed Where'er I turn my eye If I survey the ground I tread Or gaze upon the sky There's not a plant or flower below But makes I glory known and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care. And everywhere that man can be, thou God art present there. I love that song. What a great message. Amen. The mighty power of our God. Glad you're back tonight. And remember, our theme for this month is moving forward. Brother Sellers preaching on dreams on Sunday night. <clears throat> Pardon me. And just had a great, we've got a great study going on in Sunday school uh, from Joshua chapter 8 about a fresh start. So you come be a part of that. And we're just glad you're here. Brother Sellers. got a few, only a few tonight. Y'all want to come down and say your Bible verses tonight, if you would. Come on down, and you adults can get ready. Downtown Browns. guys are awesome. All righty. Get us started, Addy. Amen. Proverbs 6, 6. Look at the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and do it. Amen. Psalm 1, 2. The same is in the beginning of time. Amen. Amen. Good job. All righty. Anybody else? Any adults want to say a Bible verse tonight? We're low in number, but we're glad you're here. And Dave, go ahead. Amen. Good one. I see another hand. Miss Sandra? Amen. 
Amen. Good job. Amen. Come on. Karen? Amen. God's got help for us. Anybody else? First, we'll take testimony either. Miss Chrissy? Amen. Amen. Boy, those are great verses. Anybody else? Deborah? Amen. Anybody else? Anyone at all? Anybody in the back have a verse to say back there? Okay, y'all think about it. Just a moment. Anybody else at all? Or testimony. If you're glad you're saved, say amen. amen. I hope you are. Surely if you're saved, you'll be glad about it. Brother, you got a verse you want to share? All right, take your Bibles, turn to Philippians 3, and let's say our Bible verse from there. Philippians chapter number 3, verses 13 and 14. One we're focusing on is kind of our theme for the year. And you know, I've bumped into several preachers. We have a preacher fellowship in St. Mary's Tuesday, Brother Edward Dixon's church, and look forward to that. But several other churches and preachers and friends have chosen these verses as well. So let's say the reference and we'll say it together out loud, all right? Ready? Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Go ahead, keep going. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I stopped to see if y'all were actually saying it, and several of you were whispering, so we'll have to say it a little bit louder next time. But work on it. I think it'll be a great verse. The big part of it is we're pressing toward the mark. And you've got to forget some things behind. If you live in the past, it will drag you down and strangle you. You've got to let it go and move on to the future and trust God for great things. Did you girls want to say a Bible verse tonight while you're here? Okay, y'all, you didn't get your nap out, I can tell. That's all right. I'm glad you're here, though. We sure appreciate you coming. Brother Earl, come lead us in another song, if you would. My faith has found a resting place. 528, find that in your book. And we'll sing it together on the first verse, and then we'll wave at one another. Amen. 528. <clears throat> Like you love us, amen. Good job. All right, thank you, Brother Earl. Well, I was looking forward to a special or two tonight. I thought we had, but I understand some are a little under the weather and not able to come through with that. I did kind of mention this the other week. Uh, last week, they thought, well, maybe you didn't sing last year. We're just going to forget that. But some of you could sing for this year. We've got our standard group, and we've got a lot of talent in our church. The Lord's blessed us greatly with a whole lot of singers that not only sing good songs, but they sing from their heart, and I know they're a blessing to you. Sometime... You can really get close and worship God in a song as it's being sung. God touches your heart in a very special way, and that's great. But there may be others of you that would like to sing. Now, if you can't sing and you know it, it's all right if you don't. But if you can sing and you're just not doing it, let me encourage you uh, to get involved, and I think it'll be a blessing. Take your Bibles tonight. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
it's a familiar passage of Scripture that I want to use tonight. Um, and most of us know the story, but I want to use it as a platform upon which to build on the idea of the dreams that we've talked about. And uh, maybe you'd remember this as time goes by, but either dream, dreams, dreamer, or dreamed is found in the Bible 103 times. There are some 21 specific dreams found in the Bible. Dreams like a dream that Jacob had when he saw Jacob's ladder. A dream like King Nebuchadnezzar saw when he saw the kingdoms of the world in this great image that he saw in his dream. A dream like Joseph had in the Old Testament. Here's an interesting thing. There's a dream by Joseph in the Old Testament when Joseph dreamed that we read last week from Genesis 37, 38. And then there was a Joseph in the New Testament, the foster father of Jesus who dreamed. Isn't that interesting? But there are some 21 separate prayers. Abimelech, a wicked king, had a dream. Laban was one of the uh, uncles of uh, Jacob. He dreamed a dream. You can go through the Bible and see so many of these. But the story I want to read you tonight is, a, is connected and really is the story of David and Goliath. Most of us know this. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 17, verse 1. And then I'm going to move around just a little bit in the chapter not trying to do any injustice to Scripture, but I just want you to see and kind of get the gist of what's going on. And I'm afraid sometimes with familiar stories in the Bible, we let them go in one and out the other. And I'm asking tonight to not listen with your ear, but listen with your heart and with your mind. Think about it and let God speak to your heart. Philipp, uh, excuse me, First Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at, at Shokoth which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokoth and Azekah in Ephes Damons. And Saul and the men of Israel gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion uh, of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Remember, a cubit is, in the Bible, roughly 18 inches. Or it was measured from the fingertip, the longest fingertip, to the elbow. Now, if there were giants in those days, it could have been a bigger arm, could have went up to 22 inches. But the standard measurement is a foot and a half. So if he is these six cubits, that makes him nine feet tall. And a span. A span is the distance from this end of from your thumb to this little finger, the span of a man's hand, as you stretch it out like that. Obviously, some men have bigger hands, but the standard for that's about nine inches. So we're looking at a man who was nine foot, nine inches tall. By way of comparison, if you walk in the gymnasium and you were to go up and measure the distance from a basketball goal to the floor, you have ten feet exactly. So this is a guy who would just about scrape his head on the uh, orange rim on a basketball goal. So this is a big dude. And he's carrying a whole lot of heavy armor. Now picture this. Israel's on one side of the mountain. The Philistines are on the other side of the mountain. The valley of Elah is in between the two mountains. And in this valley, the battle is put in array. In other words, they commence to fighting, as we'd say down south. And so here they are fighting. In the middle of all this fighting and all these battles going on, one big giant strides out upon the scene. And all the battle stops and everybody notices him. And if we read the rest of the chapter, which we don't have time to do, you'll find that he stood there day after day for 40 days. And in those 40 days, he ran his mouth about what he was going to do. Y'all send out a champion to fight me, again I'm paraphrasing, and I'll fight him. And if y'all win, we'll be your servants. If we win, you'll be our servants. And a long story short is, all of the Israelites, including the king, Saul himself, were afraid to go out and tackle this man in battle. They were not about to do it. Now, I mean, I kind of sympathize with them. I understand this is a giant bigger than anything we've ever seen. Who wants to go out and take the risk of not only causing yourself to fall under his blade, but the entire nation would become servants if you lose? What a risk was involved. David, we'll find out about him. Look down at verse number 12. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse, that'd be David's three oldest brothers, went and followed Saul to the battle. 
And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the first, and the next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. Verse 15. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So the three brothers go off to battle. You get this picture? The war's going on. They're called to battle. Jesse's three oldest boys go. David's the youngest. When they leave, he bids them goodbye. He goes back to the field to take care of his sheep. Are you with me so far? While he's there doing that, he begins to get a little bit burdened about it. It begins to churn a little bit in his mind. Later on, his father is going, in these verses, is going to take David, call him in, and give him some uh, groceries and some supplies to take to the brothers down at the battlefield. And David takes these things down to the battlefield. He gets a keeper to watch the sheep because it was his responsibility to make sure the sheep were cared for. And so when David left, he gave them over to a keeper. Somebody's watching David's sheep. He does not abandon them. And in the story that we read, he goes down there, verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, that Goliath has come back out, and they saw David as he came up, fled from him and were sore afraid. Verse 25, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Now they're talking to David. Have you seen this? Surely to defy Israel he has come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free to Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it begin to boil inside of David. I showed up here to battle. I brought some groceries and supplies for my brothers, and I'm looking at the whole army of Israel standing on the sidelines, scared to death, go out and fight. Who is this? Who does this guy think he is? Somebody needs to stand up to him. Is the king going to reward the man that's willing to do it? We read a little further in verse number 27. The people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those sheep in the wilderness? It's almost a kind of a hint like, you just a little baby sheep farmer. Who'd you leave them little sheep with? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You just want to see some bloodshed and watch the battle. And David said, What have I now done? What, what did I do? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him to, toward another, and he spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. Here's what I see. David turns to his brother and says, Was there not a cause? He turns to another guy and says, Is there not a cause? And he turns to another guy and says, Is there not a cause? And he goes through the whole group there that's telling him that he ought not to be there. And he said to every one of them, Is there not a cause? Isn't there a reason that I should be here? I'm not down here just to watch. I brought some groceries. I brought some supplies. And I see this man out there and nobody's willing to fight him. The word of this gets carried by some men to Saul. Saul sends for David. He brings David. And if I again could paraphrase, Are you willing to go out and fight him? And David says, Yes, I'll go. And Saul gives him his own armor and his own sword. And David puts them on and he says, I can't wear this. I've never proved or tried this. I don't know if this armor would work. This just ain't me. He takes that armor off and he takes his sling and he goes from the brook and he borrows five smooth stones and he takes those and puts them in his bag and he only had to use one. Now, many people have speculated why he picked five stones. Some go the spiritual route and say he did it because that is symbolic of the five books of Moses. I think that's a stretch, to be honest with you. Another said this, well, Goliath had four brothers. And so if he killed one, he might have to kill the others. I think it's a little simpler than that. The Lord never told him he would kill him with one shot. So why not take enough ammunition? The worst thing he could have done was show, throw one rock and miss him, and then he ain't got no more ammunition. So whatever the reason may have been, he does this. Now, having said all of that, he goes and fights Goliath, and he wins the battle. I don't know about you, but I have to think this. Somewhere in the process of this story unfolding, David had to have a dream, if you would, a vision of what was going to take uh, to take that man out and bring victory for the children of Israel, for his own family. And in this passage is the moment in time David did not know what was going to transpire that day. Have you ever had a day in your life that something unexpected happened? And you got caught off guard 
Maybe it knocked your legs out from under you. Maybe it pleased you. Like, man, this is great. I didn't see this coming. But sometimes it's the other way. And something happens and you don't see it coming and it sort of devastates you. I think it's a little bit more in the case of David is something that he was so surprised by. He's taking groceries to his brothers. He finds out what's going on. And in, now listen carefully. In that moment of time, the day seized David. But I'm going to tell you something else. On that day, in that moment, David seized the day. It happened. He couldn't change it. It's an occurrence that seemed to be happenstance, but we know that God directed all of those circumstances. He allowed the two battles, or the battle to get started and do, the two enemies to be on opposing mountains. He allowed for the time to work out so David would get down there. He allowed Goliath to come on the scene. In other words, God allowed the whole stage to be set so David could stride into the middle of that story and win a great battle for God. And in the midst of all of that that happened, David might not have fashioned or thought about it as a dream, but I look at it that way. In, uh, let me be sure I got the date down right. In uh, January of 2008, I traveled out to Las Vegas to uh, do some gambling. Now, no, I'm just kidding. I traveled out to Las Vegas to preach. While I was out there, I had the opportunity to preach with Dr. Jack Trever, who's a tremendous man of God in a great church and college in California. I met him for the first time, heard him preach. He used a phrase in preaching a message one evening, and he used this phrase, it's a Latin phrase, carpe diem. You ever heard that? You've probably heard at least of per diem, per day that you get certain money. Well, carpe diem means to literally snatch or grab or, as we would say in common vernacular, seize the day, seize the moment. We might say it another way, take full advantage of the moment that's come before you. That's to me what happened in the case of David. He walks out there that day. His daddy sent him, basically. He takes the groceries and supplies. He notices what's going on. And in that moment and in that situation, David sees the day. He grabbed a hold of it, if you would. He grabbed it by the tail and rode it to the end. And that victory... That thing that, listen now, that thing that could have killed him. David had no guarantee he would live. All of Israel thought this is the biggest thing we've ever faced in our life and we're putting it in the hands of a teenager to walk out there and do that. But God had bigger plans. And God set the stage, guided the players in it. All of the actors fall in place. And by the time David walks out there, a dream is beginning to unfold. If David doesn't believe beyond himself that he can win this battle, Israel is going to go down. But what happens is, David is elevating the eyes of all the people. When he rides back to Jerusalem, after this, he rides through the town. All the people say this, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Now let me ask you a question. Did he kill ten thousand? He killed one. He killed Goliath. But he inspired an army to go out and fight and kill thousands of the Philistines. A day that could have been, listen now, a day that could have been his downfall, his ruin, the end of it, throwing the towel, I, th there's no way I can win this battle. David dreamed that he could. And I want to share those thoughts with you. I believe everybody has a bit of a dream. If I were to say this, if I said a phrase like this, the American dream, you've heard that phrase, haven't you? And the idea of uh, the 40s, 50s, and maybe even the 60s is the idea of like sort of grow up, get your own family, get your own house, own your own home. That's kind of the American dream, a place to call your own. Maybe you thought about the sweetheart's dream where somebody just has the idea to maybe meet, court, marry, and live happily ever after. But of those of us that are married, no, there is no such thing. But anyway, well, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Maybe the Christian's dream. What would be a dream for every Christian? How about this? To get right and to stay right and to live right in the face of all that the devil may throw at you. But then there is an individual dream. In other words, that's a personal dream that God gives to a person. Joseph had this when he dreamed about what he could do. God gave him that vision, an idea of what could be accomplished. David is faced with something here that he has to dream, if you would, think bigger 
That's what a dream is, is to think outside of yourself. We're not talking about something he had in his mind in the middle of the night like he dreamed about the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz. That's not what we're talking about. He actually saw this thing. I see this. And so I want to share a couple of thoughts with you about that. Maybe a name like Jim Elliott would ring a bell to you who had his own dream when he said this, who sacrificed his life in the jungles of South America. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. On down through the ages, many have dreamed. And no doubt you tonight, sometimes in life we face hardships and difficulties that can be nightmares. But God can take our nightmares and turn them into the dream if we learn how to make the adjustments that God wants us to make. And I want to share that three thoughts tonight. And Brother Earl said, since we didn't have any specials, I had 50 minutes to preach. I plan on not doing no such thing, just like he gave me more time. But I'm not going to do that. Three simple things. Number one, if you're going to have a dream like David had, or like Joseph, anybody in the Bible that had success, you're going to have to root your dreams in history. David went out and fought Goliath. But what most people forget is before David ever faced Goliath, David had a history. What's David's history? He was a keeper of the sheep. And one time, while he was keeping the sheep, a lion came out and tried to get one of his lambs. And David said, you ain't getting my lamb. The next time, a bear came out and tried to get one of David's lambs. And may have tried to get David. And David says this, and you can read this. I'll show it to you in your Bible. You're in chapter number 17 right there, aren't you? Look down at verse number 36. He's explaining to Saul. And he says this to Saul, Thy servant, referring to himself, slew both the lion and the bear. There, there it is. It's simple. Back in verse 34, David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And if you're not careful reading it, you might think they both came on the same day. I don't know. Maybe they came together. He had to whip them. Though. I have no idea. But here's the point. Why did David go out and face Goliath? Because he had a history. He'd done had a fight before. How did he win that fight with the bear? God helped him. How did he win the fight with the lion? God helped him. How is he going to win a fight with Goliath? God's going to help him. You see, you got to root. If you're going to believe that you can turn a nightmare into a dream, you get outside and go beyond yourself, or you can face the most difficult thing you ever have to face, and that, for some, was 2020. For some, I know, I hope 2021 is the greatest year ever, but it might not be. It could be as bad or worse than 2020. I have no idea. But if 2021 is bad, we're going to have to look back in history and realize this. You know, God brought us through 2019, and God brought us through 2020, and God will bring us through 2021. You see, you've got to root your dream in history. You've got to think back. Do you realize this? This is the way God has done everything. Every bit of past victory that we have ever had, whether it's in the life of David or ourselves, God has helped us through this. And that history built in us confidence. If I can do that with God's help, I can do this with God's help. If I can win a battle then, and if you stop and think for a moment, if you stop and think for a moment, there's been some tough things that's happened in your past. Now, yeah, you can't live on past victories, but it's all right to look back and remember this. God brought me through that, and God helped me right there. And that thing right there that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, five months ago, that thing I went through then that I thought was going to kill me, you know what? The grace of God and His goodness brought me through that. And if God can help me then, God can help me now. And God can help me tomorrow because God is a God of help and comfort for us. Rooting is a foundation. When you dig down deep and make sure that you've got your legs under you, if you will, you've got the building fitly setting on the foundation. And other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. God builds on a foundation. If you think about this, He built a New Testament on an Old Testament. If you think about it, He had prophets, then He had apostles, and then He had teachers, and He had pastors. You see this? All those things are built. He builds upon a foundation. We don't have prophets today like they did in the Old Testament, but they were the foundation. We don't have apostles today like they did in the New Testament, but they were part of the foundation. We don't have the same type of men and women that we had in that day as far as where God placed them. We don't have kings like David. 
we have a whole different form of government. But those things were part of the foundation that was built. And upon that foundation, as we look back, this is what God did, so we know then what God is able to do from there. If I said the name Billy Graham, everybody in this room knows who I'm talking about. But what you don't realize is that the success that Billy Graham had was built on the foundation of people that came before him. There was a guy that died, and he was a famous, he was a major league baseball player, and he was a drunk. And he was sitting on the street corner one time, and some people from the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, Illinois, came by, and he heard the gospel, he followed them back to the place, and he got saved. And he left professional baseball and went into the ministry. He died in 1935. His name was Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday, when his campaigns went from city to city, bars closed. I'm talking about vile places of repute closed down because Billy Sunday was coming to town. They called it hitting the sawdust trail. He'd come in, they'd set up a big tabernacle or a tent, spread sawdust out, and all this would go as Billy Sunday preached. Well, Billy Graham built on that. And Billy Sunday built on what a man named D.L. Moody did. He used to take his wagon with some horses and he'd ride somewhere and he'd stop and get a bunch of young'uns to get in the back of the wagon and he'd take them with horse and buggy to church. It was the first ever bus ministry. It just happened to be a wagon and some horses and mules. Moody, who did that, built on another guy that came before him by the name of Charles G. Finney. Charles G. Finney was a somewhat Pentecostal evangelist who did a lot of conducting of meetings. He's the first one that ever started the whole idea of come forward in church. Would you like to be saved? Come down here and let us show you from the Bible how you can be saved. You see, each one of those built on the other. And then you take a Finney, and he built on somebody else like a Spurgeon, who's a great Bible teacher and a writer. So God, that's his plan. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. Everything's built on another foundation. And as those foundations are built, it's the idea of rooting things in history. And then, if you do, and you got your feet set on that, you can look toward the future. About um, Miss Todd, you may remember, she said this to me about, I'm guessing, two or three months ago. It may have been longer. It may have been back in the summer. But she said this, I don't know what prompted it whatsoever. But we were looking around at the building or something, and she said, Brother Settles, you know what? You see all this stuff around here? You dreamed this. Do you remember saying that to me? She said, you dreamed all this. And I said, no, wait a minute. And here's the thought. I built on another foundation. You know who saw this and dreamed it before me? Brother Gary Mobley. The first past that some of y'all don't even know. If he walked in tonight, you wouldn't know him. But you see, there was a dream. And yeah, God's done a lot of things for us. And we wanted to do more. But I may be 65 years old, but I don't want to stop dreaming. I don't want to stop looking at what God can do. I'm not ready to sit back on my laurels, whatever they are, and rest. I, I mean, yeah, every now and then I do want to take a rest, and I want to pace myself. I'd like to last a long time. But what I do is I try to look back and realize this. If I'm going to dream, I don't know what happened in 2021, what happened in my life or your life, but I believe this much. Whatever it is, I want to use it for the glory of God. And no matter how difficult it may be, God can bring good things out of it. You've got to build. If you're going to root your dream in history, you've got to build on a good foundation. You also have to be willing. You've got to be willing. If you seize the day, you've got to be willing to seize something bigger than yourself. Would you agree with me that we live in a selfish society? I remember going through, I, I think it still exists, but I certainly remember there was a number of years within the last 20 when it became the me movement, I saw marriages break up because a woman would get so frustrated not getting everything she wanted to say, look, it, it, midlife crisis, what do you want to call it? Look, this is my time. I help raise the youngins. They're out of the house. This is my time. I want stuff for me. And people got centered on that. And it's not to say that the men are left out. Men have been the same way. They hit that midlife crisis and all of a sudden they want to push everything else aside and it's all about them. I want to notify all of us tonight and anybody listening by way of Facebook, it ain't about you. It ain't about you. You see, there's something bigger than you. There's something bigger than me. Well, what, what in the world is bigger than... Let me tell you something bigger than you. Your family's bigger than you. Your marriage is bigger than you. Your church is bigger than you. And yes, if you'd learn 
to get outside yourself and care about your family and your spouse and your children and your marriage and your church and your home and all those things and even your country, if you get outside of that and dream, think about that more, you'd be less inclined to get depressed with everything else that's happening in your life. I'm not trying to minimize what goes on in our lives because we all have our own personal problems and issues. There may be, listen to me now, there may be personal or private secret sin in your life and you're dealing with that and nobody knows but you. Yeah, you've got to deal with that. There may be some issues of life that you're facing physically, financially, or spiritually and you don't know exactly what to do. I do understand you've got you to deal with those things. I don't know what all those could be. But I know this much, if you're not careful and you turn all your looking and all your interest and all your dreaming inward and all you do is look at you and your failings and shortcomings, I'm here to tell you, it'll bring more depression to you and it'll ruin your spirit and your attitude and you won't be a help to nobody. I got preacher friends that have quit, have quit. And some of it's because of this. They're looking at themselves. I ain't worthy. I'm good for nothing. I'm sorry. Well, I can say amen. We all are. I'm no good. Sometimes I'm sorry as a dog. I don't do everything I'm supposed to. I fail God all the time. But by the grace of God, I want to get up again. I don't want to keep on failing. And we can go forward for the Lord. It's something big. Just living for God is bigger than just us. So I said it wasn't going to be like, I got three points. That was number one, right? Number two, number two, reproduce your dream in a picture. What I mean by that is see it. I don't think David strides out into the valley of Elah saying, I wonder what's about to happen. I think this, Nick. I think when he got those stones up, put them in his bag, pulled one out, put in his sling, I think he's thinking this as he's winding that sling up just like this there, getting ready to, getting ready to fling the sling. I mean, he's going to throw that thing and hit that giant. I think he's thinking this. I know, right, I've already pinpointed where I'm going to hit him. I don't think he just throwing it and hopes he hits him on the kneecap and he falls down and I'm going to go over and whoop him. No, I think he'd done picture it. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm fixing to take him out. He goes to slinging that thing and he gets ready. In other words, David saw Goliath hit and falling and dead before it ever happened. I think he envisioned, I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to do this. Uh, late, uh, earlier, maybe last week, uh, Michael Brown bought with me a VHS tape. Now, several of y'all don't know what that is, but that one of those VCR tapes, and he brought it, and it's a tape of 1998 when our I was coaching the boys, and we won our first state championship in basketball playing at a Macon College gymnasium. And those are, I specifically remember that because there was a time when Michael got stuck with the ball. He was about three feet inside of the half-court line, and the idiot shot the ball. And I'm like, Michael, what are you doing? About that hand, it went through the net. And I said, good shot. That's the way to go. But he brought me that tape. Now listen, you can't go. I've coached enough to know. You can't go into a championship game against a team that year from Jacksonville, Victory Christian, that had beat us at home. They beat us at their gym. They beat us for the region championship. We'd already lost to them three times that year. You say, I bet y'all face that with, here we go again, we're going to lose one more time. Then you don't ever win. you got to go into that thinking this. You might have beat us three times, but you ain't going to beat us four. It's hard to beat somebody three times, but it's really hard to beat somebody four times. And by the grace of God, we're going to give everything we got. In other words, you've got to see the championship before you have it. You've got to envision that idea. I preached Friday in chapel on those who dream for you. I sort of described the scenario. There's not a parent in here that when you first found out you're expecting your first child, you weren't, weren't maybe excited about it and thrilled. And you imagine what it would be like when that little bundle of joy came into the world. And you went home and you worked hard to get a nursery ready. And you got a bassinet ready. And you got a baby bed ready. You got all that ready. Notified all your friends. And all those things began to take place. And parents began to dream of when that baby arrives and what it's going to be like. And sometimes they turn out to be a nightmare at, at 3 in the morning when they're crying and squalling. Your wife has to get up. I think she should and change a diaper. Can I get amen there? But anyway... As you begin to envision that, see, parents dream for their children. And here's what I'd say. I know we don't have many kids here tonight, but I'd say to all you kids, don't shatter mom and daddy's dreams. Help 
they're dreaming for you because they want something great to happen in your life. They want something good to be there. And they mean well for you in everything they do, every guideline or restriction parents give. Don't we mean well for our kids? We want them to turn out right. But parents dream. Preachers dream. And I dream for them for more than just our kids. I mean, I dream for the day we have an auditorium like this. I dream for the day we have adults who say Bible verses instead of just the kids. I dream for the day some of your kids or even you walk down an aisle to get saved. I remember going to Bob's house and sharing the gospel with him when he put his trust in Christ. That's a dream come true sitting right there and sitting beside him is his nightmare. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding, Miss Rosemary. You know I love you. Some of you, all right, listen to me carefully. Some of you, when life became so hard and difficult and you couldn't dream, I dream for you. I dream to see you'll make it. You're going to come through this. I've watched in the many years I've been here, I've watched people lose loved ones from spouses to children. I've watched marriages fall apart. I've watched death take place. And in all those moments when you couldn't dream, they was somebody else. In some cases it were parents. In some cases it was your preacher. In some cases it was a teacher. In some cases it was just a friend. And they dreamed for you. And so you've got to reproduce that. In your mind, you've got to see it. David saw it happening before it happened. And finally tonight, you have to reinforce your dream with determination. Um, it costs something for David to go out. The big risk involved costs something to go out and fight Goliath. You say, well, he didn't have to go to the store and buy anything. He got the rocks free. That's true. But would you have risked your life that day? He had three older brothers all of whom I'm sure would have said this much, I'll take you out behind Jim and whoop your tail. Every older brother thinks they can whoop their younger brother. That's just the way it is. Don't matter what the size differential is, I can whoop them. I got them. I have a younger sister, and I know I can whoop her. I'm glad I don't have a brother to worry about. Thank you for laughing. What I'm saying is this. Everything in the story is David taking a risk. It's going to cost him something. You've got to be willing to step out. Now listen to me. Some of you, and I know we may be small in number, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. It has no bearing on it whatsoever. I came from a small church, and one night somebody preached a message and challenged my heart about salvation, and I got saved. Another time somebody preached and challenged me about giving my life to Jesus Christ to serve Him and to be a preacher of the gospel, and I, I yielded. I gave in. It had nothing to do with the crowd that was there. But listen, some of you, God has spoken to you, but you're not following, you're not obeying, you're not giving, because you're scared to take that risk. You're scared to step out by faith. And God, every missionary we've had here over these past years, has been somebody who's willing with their husband and wife and children to take a step of faith out and say, this is what God called me to do, and I'm going to do it. And they had to do so with determination. Because you know family and friends said, are you crazy? If you've ever dreamed big, somebody has said, you're dreaming. But I say this to them, you go ahead and dream anyway. With determination, David is going to cost him something. By the way, this isn't the only great thing David did in his life. You know that. He's a man after God's own heart. I'll tell you another really big thing he did is this. He had a desire in his heart to build the temple. Y'all remember that story? And David said this, he was going to build a temple for the glory of God. And God said this, I'm not letting you build the temple because you're a man of war and have shed much blood. David, you will not be allowed in your lifetime to build the temple. So here's what David did, okay? All right, I don't get to build it, but maybe my son can build it. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to gather all the supplies, get all the wood and all the silver and all the gold and all the stone. I'm going to get all the supplies and I'm going to get them all. I can do that. God didn't say I couldn't get ready. He just said I couldn't build it. And David gathered all the supplies necessary for the building of the temple. And then when David moved off the scene, God used Solomon to build the temple. And isn't it interesting that David, who got all the stuff for the temple, it ended up being called Solomon's temple. Not David's. But I don't think it mattered. A man after God's own heart, he don't care the name on the front. He just cared that this thing, this big, massive cathedral is built for the glory of God, and I hope God is honored by what I've done. That was David. 
And he had to be determined to get that done. It's not enough to talk about it. We've got to be willing to take the steps necessary to do it. There will be others who attack us, who ridicule and mock us as David's brothers did him. There will be people who stand in opposition to us. There is no doubt about that. But if we'll maintain that dream and keep it in front of us, and by the grace of God, we can do it. We can do it. I don't know what it is for you that it will take to turn a nightmare into a dream, but I, I suggest to you this. Seize the day. Grab it with all the gusto and life that you can. Realize this much, that the opportunity is before you to face hardships and difficulties, but turn them into things that will bring glory to God. And if God helps you in the past, He'll help you now. Picture in your mind where you want to be. And by the grace of God, we'll be there. And then also determine that you're going to see the thing through to the end. And if that's reading your Bible through, then fight tooth and nail. If that's to be a tither, fight tooth and nail. If that's to win a soul to Christ, fight tooth and nail. Do all that you can to seize the day. Let's pray together. Father, thank you tonight for the good attention these folks have given as I've shared your word. And I pray that you are speaking, I trust that you are, speaking to hearts, minds, and lives tonight. Forgive us where we failed you. We sure have made a mess of many things. But Lord, that you're a God of forgiveness and grace and a God of second and third and fourth chances. And Lord, some that uh, of those mistakes that we've made, we without you, we just couldn't pick up the pieces and go forward. But I believe with your help and mercy and grace, we can. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. Bless your word to hearts tonight. And may everyone in here be more willing to lean on you for strength and to dream big for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Miss Lori is going to play on the piano tonight. The altar is open if you'd like to come and pray. You can just be seated for now as she plays. And let the Lord deal with your heart. Thank you, Miss Laura. You can look this way. In preparing these messages, uh, most of these messages, if not all of them, uh, prepared back in like November. And you begin to get ready to preach these things. And you know, at the time, I tend to think this, why has the Lord put that on my heart? And uh, I don't always know the answer to that. But I just preach what I feel like God's laid on my heart. And I trust Him to deal with your heart as a result. So I want you to know this. We need to pray. Uh, some of you may have heard through the grapevine that uh, Mike Henson, if y'all remember, Mike, he was brother-in-law to brother Mike Fuller. Mike Henson passed away last night. You might recall his daughter, uh, Michelle, long red hair, back when they usually sat back in the back over to my right here. She passed away. So if y'all would remember their family, the Henson family, uh, in prayer, if you would. Brother Mike Dixon uh, had gallbladder surgery this week. And everything went good. He's home and resting and doing good. So y'all continue to pray for him. And I know there are probably other needs that I can't mention right now, but let's remember these needs as well. Anything else before we dismiss? Glad you came to say amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.